Holy, holy, yeah, sit down if you can. Good goodness. Woo! You missed that one. Oh, my goodness, brother. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I, I tell you, uh, you know, we, we brat, yeah, you can hear it in there. We, uh, we, uh, we, love to, we love to hear our praise team. They are just awesomely good. I guarantee you they are. By the way, let me just mention this to you. You might be interested in this. Uh, of course, you guys know that I'm really not a social network person. Uh, the only Facebook I ever see, Tanya reads it to me. Uh, if you guys write anything or if there's something that she feels like I need to see or know or whatever about this circling around on Facebook and so forth. And uh, tweets, I don't even, I mean, I've heard the word before. I kind of know what it means, but I don't really know how to do it or I've never done it. I don't know what it means, but I know you follow somebody on Twitter and whatever that means. And and uh, and then, you know, I do know about YouTube because I, I look at YouTube on some things. You can almost find anything on YouTube nowadays, by the way. But uh, even things to work, you know, and, and how to do things and so forth. But anyway, uh, in connection with that, we are, uh, our church services on Twitter. You can follow us or, or uh, and, or, and that kind of thing. And it's on now on YouTube. We have a channel on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube now, uh, I don't think that it's live. Like Facebook is live, and there are people watching right now on Facebook that are watching the service live, and they watch everything that happens in the service, every bit of it. On YouTube, uh, it's put on like this afternoon, and it has only the music and the message. It doesn't have all of the announcements and prayers and offerings and all kind of things like that. And, and it's divided, so you can just watch just the music section or watch just the message or, you know, watch both. It's just a, a, an effort to make it where people who are interested in certain things can get to them quickly without having to scan through a whole bunch of other stuff. So anyway, uh, welcome to the uh, digital age. <laughs> And I'm glad to be here. We have lots of uh, digital disciples, I guess we would call them, uh, watching us on YouTube and hopefully now, I mean, watch us on Facebook, hopefully YouTube and Twitter and all of that and making all these things available so that you can watch them throughout the week or at any time, you know, even months from now, you can go back and, and watch things or uh, see some things that would be important to you. I love to watch our band. Uh, the music's really good. If you, if you haven't watched it before, it really sounds good. It really sounds very good. Um, it's, it's not quite like it is live, uh, but of course, you know, you wouldn't really expect it to be exactly like it is live, but it's really good representative, and uh, it's not just like a little tiny mic sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and you're trying to hear it through some phone jack somewhere. I mean, it's top-notch, and it's, uh, it looks really good. The visuals are good, and so uh, I encourage you to pay attention to that. Watch it some if it blesses you. And uh, that's why we put it there. And also use it as a tool. Maybe you have friends that, you, that would like, you would like for them to hear something and say, hey, man, let me show you something. And then you can have it there as a tool to uh, make an impact into their life. And even some of the message points or something that you think would be helpful or beneficial to somebody else, now you have a place to send them and say, hey, watch this. And this is a good word for exactly where you are right now. And uh, it'll help you. So with all that in mind, uh, you guys know that we're in the family series, uh, Whole Relationships. Yeah, I just put it up there, but Whole Relationships. How many of you have been here for, for the whole series so far? All of them, every bit of them. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, just hold your hand up. Don't be bashful. I mean, you're not ashamed, are you? <laughs> really? All right, well, we're so glad that you have. If you have, so far we've been through... Um, the whole man, we did that on Mother's Day, and I tried to help you guys be aware of what you need to be as a whole man that would be beneficial to your wife and would, uh, so that you could provide for her what God has placed you in her life to provide. You know, God had a plan from the very beginning. He created us male and female, Genesis says, created he them in other words, God did it on purpose. God made us different on purpose. There are two genders, male and female, and God did that on purpose. And we have different needs, different desires, different thoughts, different communication. Really, just about every single aspect of our life are different. 
And I know you're aware of this because how many of you men have ever figured out women? Huh? All right, don't raise your hand. Oh, Don, you ain't figured out anybody. <laughs> you let... <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> And how many of you women have figured out men, you know? You say, oh, man, these men, good night. You know, can't live with them, can't live without them. Can't live with them. Yeah, you might better choose another seat, Mark. Yeah, that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. But anyway, we've talked about men, and we've talked about couples. And uh, I tried to share with you some thoughts about godly couples and whole couples. And if you miss that and you are a couple or you're headed for a couple to be a couple, uh, you might want to might, might tune in on that and uh, go back and listen to it. And uh, there's a few things in there that I think would be very helpful for you uh, to put in your memory banks and to begin to practice uh, some interesting things that will help you. And then we went to um, whole singles. And in the message on whole singles, I tried to encourage all of our singles to use the opportunity while you are uh, a sole proprietor of your life, while no one else is in a corner office deciding what happens in your life, you are it and you can do as you please, especially in relationships, that you use that time to do some things that would be beneficial to your life and help make your life better and more prepared uh, as you, for, for the most part, uh, look for a mate. Because most of you will look for a mate. You will want a mate. Um, that's the way God designed us to be. A few of you probably have been given a gift from the Lord that in 1 Corinthians 7, God says that, that he gives gifts, and, uh, and occasionally there are some that have the gift of celibacy, which just simply means you don't need someone in your life. You, you don't long for that. You don't crave that. You don't have a desire for that. It doesn't mean you're antisocial or something's wrong with you. It just means that's just not the way God made you. And so if that's you, then don't feel like you have to have a mate to have a nice life. I mean, there, Jesus did pretty good, you know, without a mate. And the Apostle Paul spent most of his life without a mate. And so there, you know, you don't have to be a, be a couple in order for life to be grand. And that message was really all about that. Then I started last week, and I'm, I'm in this week, on a message about, uh, about child rearing. Child rearing. Uh, and I know when I say the word rearing that some of you go, whoo, that's a what word. I raise these kids. No, you raise crops. You rear children. I mean, there is a distinction. So, anyway, how about building children? How about building champions? That's a better word, isn't it? That's why we called it uh, building champions in a snowflake world, because I knew some of you would balk on the rearing word, but I always try to. Anyway, anyway, I'm on campaign. No, forget all that. <laughs> but I, I, I talked about last week, and I got all involved in... Uh, in end time issues concerning the family. And, you know, I really uh, don't apologize, obviously, for it because I believe the Lord leads me in what I say, and I, I pray that. I want that to be true. And I don't want to say things just uh, to vent out what my thoughts are about things because I don't believe the pulpit is a place uh, to display all of my ideas and concepts about life. I believe, I take it very seriously that when I stand before you like this, that I'm here uh, representing what God would say to us. And I know I'm not God, and so don't, you know, say, oh, pastor thinks, no, I'm not God. But I do believe that I hear from God. I do believe God leads me and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and impresses my heart and mind and, and about issues and about things that, that would be uh, beneficial for us as a church to be involved in. I am a pastor, and so I'm here every week. I'll be here next week and the next week and the next week and the next week. And five years from now, the Lord willing, if you want to find me, it's not hard. I'll be right here on Sunday morning. Uh, sharing what the Lord's put on my heart. So because that's true, it means that uh, whatever I say and whatever I preach 
man, I've got to stand in it because you're going to be back and, uh, and you're going to try these things and you're going to pray about these things. You're going to do these things. And so I'm responsible and accountable to what I say and what I preach. So I'm very serious about that, especially with the family. My wife, Tanya, and I have been married for 40 years. I know that's shocking to you uh, because I look so young, but um, I got married very young in life. No. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was 21. Tanya was barely, barely 19. She turned 19 on Friday night. The next Friday night, we got married. So that's where we were. And uh, children came along. I was 23. She was 21. Justin came. And then Amy, and uh, now we have eight grandchildren, and we've been married for 40 years, and life has just, whoo, just flown by, you know. And I'll just tell you, look, before you know it, it, it'll be there, and you'll be looking back going, what in the world happened with all of that time in my life? So it's very important that you do what you should do while you have the opportunity to do that. Because you're not always going to have the opportunity to be the kind of parent that you need to be to this generation of children. This generation of children are facing some very difficult things. And I know that you're aware of this, and I know the world that we live in is right before you, is present in you from every moment. And it's just seemingly more and more severe all the time. I mean, we just, uh, you guys woke up uh, yesterday to bombing in London and uh, people killed on the bridge. And, and it just seemed like every day it's, it's something like that. Or maybe even worse than that. Uh, people's lives, just innocent people, just going about living life, just going to concerts, walking on a bridge, you know, shopping downtown go into a restaurant or whatever it might be, and then the next moment, they're not here. And it seems so indiscriminate and so uh, dangerous. Well, this is the world that we're in now. And whether we want to be in this world or not, that's the world that we're in. And we can imagine things and we can plan things and we can say it shouldn't be this way, and why does it have to be this way? And I don't want it to be this way. And we can get, you know, we can strategize all these fantasy schemes. But when you wake up, it's that way. That's the way it is. So as parents and as families and as Christians, we have to live in this world. Your children are going to live in this world. Should the Lord tarry, your grandchildren are going to live in this world. Like I said, I have eight grandchildren. I almost, uh, really, I have some grandchildren that are old enough in a few a couple of years or so probably to have some great-grandchildren. I'm not advertising for it, mind you. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm just saying that, I'm just saying that uh, we all have a stake in what happens, you know. We all have a future to look to and people that we love that will go into the future that'll be here when we're not here anymore. And only the things that we've placed in their lives will really carry them forward. Because I'm going to tell you something. It's very difficult nowadays to rear godly children. It's very difficult to train godly children in this craziness that we live in. As a matter of fact, it's becoming more and more severe uh, to even be a Christian in this crazy world we're living in. You know, there, there was a time where I remember specifically, it, would be, it was hard for me to believe that Christians could ever be looked at in a negative light. I mean, followers of Christ, people who loved their families, paid their bills, honored their society, were patriotic and wonderful and try to do right and live right and help others and be compassionate and just reflect all the images that Christ reflected, it was hard for me to imagine that people like that could be looked at in a negative light. But nowadays, to be a Christian is probably one of the most detrimental things about our life that we could claim. I, you know, it's just one of those things where the crazy world we're living in, everything that ought to be exalted 
uh, is put down and everything that ought to be put down is exalted. It's the twilight zone that we're living in. It's craziness. It's delusion, like I said last week. And so I don't want to really get back into that if you really want to get hear the ranting and raving of all of that. And the thoughts about that, get, get, go back to last week. But let me, let me give you some pointers now on how to rear children, how to rear champions, how to build champions in this, in this snowflake world we're living in. All right, And I'm just going to start off with a passage of Scripture, not all the Scripture I read last week, but here's one. This is the book of Malachi. This is the last book of the Old Testament. These are the last two verses of the Old Testament. And it gives you God's program. It gives you God's format for what he's going to do in the future. Uh, so here's what he says at the end of the Old Testament. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, we know, because we have a New Testament, we know what happened after these verses. We know that in about 400 years or so, roughly, uh, uh, John the Baptist was birthed by Elizabeth, uh, a lady that had been given this pregnancy as a miraculous thing in her husband, Zechariah, in the temple. And, and he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was born about six months before Jesus was born. And Everywhere he went, he went around preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He baptized Jesus in the Jordan River and he, he told everybody, this is the Messiah that has come. You receive him. You know, I'm not worthy to untie his shoelaces, John the Baptist said. And he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Repent and get right and make ready for the coming of the Lord. Well, in the end days, the Bible makes it very clear that there will be someone that will have this same spirit, this Elijah spirit. It doesn't mean that Elijah himself is going to be reincarnated and brought back to walk around on this earth. It means that the spirit that that anointed Elijah and the spirit that brought forth the prophecy and the words of Elijah and the strength and the boldness and the courage of Elijah would be revisited on this earth before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day when Jesus comes and the world stands before the Lord, before those terrible, horrible times that the book of Revelation tell us are very real and very true and very certain before those great and terrible days, the Lord will bring a spirit that will encourage this earth to repent and to get right with God one more time before Jesus comes. Come on, man. you got one more chance. Here it is. And, 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 we'll, and we'll be the voice crying in the wilderness. And what does the Bible say this voice will be saying? This voice will be saying, you parents, watch your children. You parents, love your children. You parents, be close to your children. You parents, be parents to your children. And it will be encouraging children, cling to your family. Love your family. Honor your family. Be a part of the family. In other words, according to the Bible, the thing that will bring revival on this earth in the last days is the fact that families will become families again. And the hearts of parents will be turned to their children. And when the hearts of the parents are turned to their children, the children are then going to turn to their parents. In other words, not a war between the young and the old, between parents and children, but a, but a unity that will, that will draw us toward our Heavenly Father. Because I'm going to tell you, and this is just a psychological issue, and I'm, I'm not a psychologist, and you know that. I'm not the son of a psychologist, and I'm not trying to be one. But I, I have been around long enough to tell you this, and I've seen enough people's lives to tell you this, that, all, that many people who have great issues with their father have great issues with God. And when they get right with their father, their earthly father, then there's a natural draw to get right with their heavenly Father. It's an amazing thing to see. It's just an amazing thing to see. One of the problems that we have, 
and I say we, we Christians, we that have done mission work in other places and other lands, one of the real problems we have in places where the family is not strong, where fathers are not uh, attendant to their families and they, 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 there's not a, a real strong father base in the home, it's really difficult to get those people to understand God because he's our heavenly father, and they don't really know what that means. What is a father? Well, I don't know. I don't have one. He left us. You know, he has five families. I, I mean, they, they just don't have the concept of a father who loves them and provides for them and takes care of them and shares with them. And I'm just saying to you that in the last days, one of the great and tremendous words from God that are going to change hearts and lives will be to turn the hearts of parents to their children and children to their parents. Now, here's a great verse in the book of Proverbs, or excuse me, the book of Psalms, chapter 127, that really talks to us about children and what these children can be in our life. Children are a gift from the Lord. Amen, parents? <laughs> That's not too hearty. I don't really think you mean that. Uh, amen, parents? Amen. All right, all right. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Children are born, children born to a young man are like sharp arrows in a warrior's hands. In other words, your children, parents, can become tremendously valuable weapons against the enemy. That's really what that's saying. It's saying that the children that you have born to you can be loyal and faithful to you, can be honorable to you, can protect your interests, can watch out for you, can defend you, can protect you, can move with you. These children are part of a team, and you are the leader of the team, and they are like sharp arrows in your hand, and they're valuable to protect your life. And then he goes on to say, how happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. And, uh, of course, that's talking about having these nice, large families, which uh, we seemingly don't have <laughs> anymore. But it's just an encouragement about your children. It's really all I'm trying to get to. It's just an encouragement that your children are intended by God to be a blessing to you. They're intended to be uh, uh, something that will help you and encourage you and be a great part of your life. I can't imagine my life without my children. I don't, I don't know. It would be seemingly, you know, and I don't want to paint such a morbid picture because I know some of you may be out there that, you know, you've tried to have children all your life and you just, you just haven't been able to have any. And I know it's a very sad thing, so I don't want to add to that. But I'm just saying that children are intended by the Lord to be a great thing in your life. But just like your marriage, you have to build your children. They're not, they're not just automatically great. Just like there are no great marriages that are just great <laughs> for no reason, you know. I just found the right one. Oh, I found my soulmate. You know, I mean, we have all kinds of things we might say. But whether, whether they're your soulmate or not, I'm telling you, you're going to have to work on this marriage or it's not going to be good. You're going to have to build it. You're going to have to know what to do. You're going to have to do some things you might not want to do. You're going to have to learn a few things and practice a few things that are not natural, that are not normal, that don't just come to you, you know, in a natural kind of a way. And just so, you have to do this with child rearing, with building your children, with building your family. So I want to give you about 10 commandments real quick. If you got the notes, uh, good. You'll have some spaces to write these little uh, words down. There's only one little part that, that, that's not in there because it didn't have room to put it in there, but it's going to be, you'll see, see what it is in a, in a few minutes. Let's just start with the very first one. All right. The first commandment, the first thing about child rearing, the first thing about building champions is you need to establish your, look at your neighbor and say, your, your, <laughs> your your authority from birth. I'm just saying to you that your home has to have an authority and it doesn't need to be the kid. If the children are in charge of the home, it's going to be a mess. I'm just going to tell you that. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's going to be really more than a mess. It's going to be dangerous to be in this home. And I'll just give you one example because we've got 10 of these things. Uh, in the book, in the Old Testament, uh, you, you are aware of King David, right? He's one of our favorite characters in the Bible. He's the great, everybody, if you ask a question, who's your favorite character? A lot of people say, King David. Well, King David had uh, family, 
And uh, as a matter of fact, he had about 51 kids. I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Had lots of uh, uh, concubines and wives and blah, blah, blah. That was the Old Testament. And had about 51 kids. He was a pitiful father. He was a great king, but a pitiful father. Uh, he had a, one of his sons named Amnon raped his sister, which was another one of David's children named Tamar. And the issue was brought to David, the father. And you know what David did about it? Nothing. David did nothing about it. So you know who did do something about it? Another, another child in the family by the name of Absalom. And Absalom took care of Amnon for raping Tamar, his sister. And then you know what Absalom did? Absalom then began to take the kingdom away from his father, David. And it ended up with being a civil war in the nation of Israel over who was going to rule the kingdom until Absalom was finally killed by one of the great generals of King David. I mean, it was a horrible catastrophe and a terrible tragedy. You say, why did that happen? Well, I'm going to tell you, Dad, if you won't be dad in your family, one of your boys is going to try to be dad. One of your girls are going to try to be dad. Somebody's got to be dad in the family. Somebody has to be the authority in the family. And if you won't take it, they're going to try to take it because everybody knows there has to be an authority somewhere. God designed organizations and groups and families and churches and everything else to have a head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we obey the head. We, we follow Christ. He's our leader. He's, our, he, he's in charge. He's our authority in life. This is not a democracy in the strict sense of a democracy being everybody has a vote and everybody's vote counts the same. This is not a democracy. This is a benevolent dictatorship is what this is. There is one person in charge and, and that person's benevolent and thoughtful and thankful and kind and gracious and wonderful and giving and everything else, but they are the authority. And that's what a family is. A family is a benevolent dictatorship. Dad, you're it. And if there's no dad, mom, you're it. Really, you're both it, and you should both work together and don't ever show disloyalty to each other or allow the children to play both of you against each other because they will do that. Don't argue in front of them. Don't undermine each other. Follow each other. Be on the same team because it all really matters in establishing the authority of of the family. You, ought, you need to teach your children to respect you. Do not allow them to talk to you like you're a child or like you're on the same level with them. I never could imagine calling my dad Paul or my mother Eloise. I probably would have had to pick myself up off the ground if I'd ever tried to do that. Now I know, and listen to me, and I understand, and I'm not trying to, you know, I know there are lots of issues in homes and lots of you are in uh, families where you've had divorce and you have children and you have some that are teenagers and so forth and, it, and they don't want to call the new person mom or the new person dad because they, that's not really their dad or really their mom and you can work that out. But the point being that, that, dis, that respect to authority, teach them to say yes ma'am and no ma'am. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, a, it, it's very necessary to teach authority. I mean, you're teaching authority. You're not just teaching them to respect you. You're teaching them to re respect the authority. The teacher when they go to school. The police officer when they come up against the law. The boss that's going to hire them and pay them to do a job for the rest of their life. I mean, all these authority issues, it, it starts at home. And don't allow them to disrespect you or others that should be respected in your home. And then you need to respect them also. Now, it doesn't need to be pampered to. And listen, you are not their friend. God did not put you in their life to be their friend. They have lots of friends. They need parents. You are a parent. You are not a friend. God did not design you to be a friend. Don't try to be a friend. You are a parent because it's your responsibility to establish authority in the life of a child from birth. All right, number two. Understand the child's temperament. Let me give you a passage out of Proverbs. Proverbs 22.6. And I know you've heard this before. 
Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way in which he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I know that there have been many ideas about this passage, and I know you've probably quoted this passage many times. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I, I would... I, I, I'm going to believe that you probably have a little a misconception about this verse uh, uh, that I'm, I'm going to speak to in just a moment. But, but listen to what I say before you disagree, all right? This verse says, train up a child in the way in which he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, I know that many Christian parents all through the years have taken this verse to mean, if I will take my child to church when they're small, even if during the middle part of their life they don't ever go to church and they don't know anything about God and they turn their back on God, but when they get old, they will come back to church and come back to God. They won't stay away from God forever. That, that's kind of how that verse has been used in mainstream church a lot. Now, let me just ask you something. Is that comforting to you? Does that comfort you to, to think that that your child that you take to church and you try to teach them to love the Lord and then all of a sudden they go away for a long time in their life, but then they're going to come back at, at the end. What happens if they die while they're out there and then before they came back and all that? And in other words, I'm just saying that that's not what that verse means. What that verse means is that every child has a bent, a, a, a psychological word, B-E-N-T. It means I'm bent in a certain way. I have a certain personality. I have a certain nature. I have a certain mindset. I have uh, skills, gifts, and abilities. I have certain talents. I have, a, I have certain ways that I do things and things that will get through to me. Well, every child has that. And what that verse is saying is, parents, you need to know your children so well that you know which way they're bent. So that whenever it comes to leading them to what they should do in life and what their future should be, listen, I don't know about you, but when a child is 17 or 18 years old, they don't know what life is about. They don't know what they want to do. I mean, at 18 or 19 or 17, boy, they're making decisions about, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that and I'm going to do this and I need to study that. And, that. and they haven't even lived life at all to know what they actually need or want to do in life. This is why they, got, they have parents. They have parents because you are to know your child's bent and you are to, to move your child in the way in which they are bent. Train up a child in the way in which he should go. Not you should go. Not what you want out of life. But what they can do. What they can be successful in. What they can accomplish. And what they can have a great life. You have to pay attention and you have to know these things. And when they're old, it's going to be a blessing to them because they will have spent their life doing something they enjoyed, something that they were they worked in and they were able to do and capable to do and earned a living and had a family and had a great life. Because you got them started out right. Because you helped them know what to do. Because you have lived a lot of life. You do know what's going on in life. And it's your responsibility to understand that each of your children are different. And you can't treat them all alike. You can't discipline them all alike. You can't talk to them the same way. Some of them, you can, you can break their spirit with the words you say in a heartbeat. And the other one could care less what you say about anything. They're climbing a tree and they're not even paying attention to you. You have to know them, see, because they're being in different ways. There's no cookie cutter, one size fits all in child rearing. All right, number three. Is this okay? Are y'all all right? Am I doing them? Okay. You're not fixing to leave me, are you? All right. All right, number three. Number three. Place the most emphasis on character and values. Place the most interest on character and value. I loved it. Who was it, Carter, that got the character award? Justin. Oh, Justin Hill got the character award. Really, Justin? Good. That's awesome, man. I, I, well, I hate to sound so surprised, but I'm really not. Man, Justin's a great guy. Seriously, he is, boy. Self-control, yeah. Character. 
I, I didn't even know they gave character awards, did you? <laughs> it's so great. But but my, my point is, my point is, all right, character, and if you had your note, if you had the notes that I gave out for you and you, you had them, you would see the word character is derived from a Greek verb that means to scratch or to engrave upon. When you take time to form your child's character, it is though you are indelibly engraving upon him the things that are important. So Character is what you teach them is important. Now, here's how you teach them. You live it. Character is not taught. Character is caught. You catch character from somebody who has it. You watch the way they live. You observe what is important to them. You hear the words that they say to you about the, the, the things that are important to you in life. Uh, being on time, getting a good education, you know, uh, putting on clean underwear, whatever it might be, you know. I mean, the things that are important, you know. Man, I got a character, being a clean, moral person, you know, being a respectful human being. Uh, whatever the character issues that you are taught, that is your character. And then values are really what they appear to be. It's the things that you uh, think are, are valuable, you know? I mean, what is, what is it that you value in life, you know? You value, you value godliness. You value cleanliness. You know, you value respect. You value honor, uh, chastity. I mean, whatever it might be, morality. I mean, the values that you believe are important in life, you etch them in your children by the way you live in front of your children. Man, you can be, don't be hypocritical and say one thing and live another way. Man, you're creating some dysfunction there. You're creating children that are learning how to disrespect the things you say you believe and how to disrespect you because they see, although you say great things, you don't live that way. You make it hard for them to respect you when you do this. Now, no parent is perfect, and don't think I'm talking about, oh, I can never make a mistake. You'll be surprised how forgiving children can be if they know you're really trying. I mean, come on, man. Dad's trying hard. Go, oh, hey, he messed up. Okay, come on, Dad. Give him a break. Dad's trying hard. Come on, Dad. We're going to help you. You know, I mean, teach them. Put the most emphasis on character and values. Number four, limit the number of rules. This really goes with that. And, and um, you can't make up rules for every single thing that happens in the family. You can't just have a whole bunch of rules and every time something happens, you make a new rule. Because if you do that, what you're going to have is you're going to have a whole list of rules and you are going to become some kind of truancy officer or some kind of, you know, uh, uh, family policeman trying to make sure everybody always follows all these rules. You need to have very few rules. But those rules need to be very specific and certain about life. And then everything else revolves around very few rules. Let me suggest four rules to you. Number one, you, the rule is we must love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Rule number one in our family, we love God more than we love anything else. That takes care of everything. Are we going to church today? You know, um, uh, what's going to happen? Are we going in the morning? Do we need to get ready for church? Or am I going to youth group? Uh, it, it answers all those questions. There's no doubt. We love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anything to do with God, that's our rule. Number two, we love our neighbor as ourselves. Don't be throwing rocks at the neighbor's windows. Don't take your BB gun and shoot out the streetlight over your neighbor's house. Don't be breaking in and stealing stuff out of his shed. Stay off of his fence. You know, quit tormenting his dog. And uh, this covers all of the rules concerning treating other people properly and respectfully and honoring other people's possessions and property and values and everything else. See, that just cuts out all the rules for that. We honor God, rule number one. Number two, we love our neighbor. Rule number three, 
Uh, Luke 6, 631, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So, so far we got three rules. Love God, love our neighbor, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That'll cover a lot of rules, won't it? Let me give you the last one. Don't lie. That's the rule. Don't lie. Whatever you did, don't lie. Look, I, 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 know, I, I know we can do some tough things. I know some things can be embarrassing. I'm certainly not going to tell you everything I did as a child. I did some embar really embarrassing, stupid, crazy stuff. And I know children do these things. And it's awful, it's awful easy for, to lie. But, but teach your children. Here's the rule of our family. We don't lie. Whatever you did, you tell me what you did. I can handle what you did. But I, I can't handle you lying to me about it. Uh-uh. No, it's going to be multiple, multiple, multiple. So teach them those four things. That's all the rules you need, right? Maybe a few more, you know, like put the clothes in the basket instead of on the floor, stuff like that. You know, that kind of thing right there. All right, number five. Listen to your child before passing judgment. Listen to them before you decide uh, what's right or what's wrong. And the principle of this, now listen, let me tell you the principle. What you're teaching them when you listen to them tell you what happened before you jump to the conclusion that you know what happened because of past stuff. What you're teaching them by letting them tell you before you respond is you're teaching them justice. You're teaching them the principle of justice. Like, if I get punished, I'm going to be punished for what I did, not for what they think I did. So you listen to them. I don't care if little Johnny is always the one that starts it and he's always the one... Don't assume that little Johnny is guilty every single time. Let little Johnny come to you and tell you what he did, and then you determine what needs to happen based on what each incident, what actually happened with each incident. Let them settle down. Let them talk to you. What did you do? What did you do? And I'm going to go ahead and mention it because I'll mention it in some other things here real quickly. But we're not talking about why. We're not talking about why you did it. Don't ask them why. You know why? They're going to lie. <laughs> um, yeah, they're going to break rule number. They're going to break rule number four. If you ask them why, they're almost always going to lie. You are just encouraging them to lie. So don't ask them why. Just say, "What did you do? What did you?" You're not. You're not getting punished because of why. You're getting punished because of what you did. You, you know, you pulled off the neighbor's screen door. That, that's what you did. All right? You're getting punished for pulling off the neighbor's screen door, not why you did it, but the fact that you did it. You know? <laughs> that's what it is. So anyway, let me go on. All right. Uh, listen to your child before passing judgment. Oh, okay. Now here comes uh, some little intrusions in here. Discipline corporally. Do you know what I mean when I say corporally? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't say whooping on the internet um, because everybody, everybody, I just did. Everybody go, oh my God, oh, this evil, listen to this evil pastor on here. Listen to this evil person on here. He's killing them. No, I'm talking about what the Bible teaches us about punishing our children. Uh, yeah, that, that there are many instructions in the Bible, and they all say the same thing. Spare the rod, spoil the child, blah, blah, blah. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to help you with this, all right? So don't jump to some conclusions, just like I said in the last one. Don't jump to conclusions. Here's what, what you need to do. Punish, do not punish your child for being a child. This is, and I know it's hard not to sometimes. I mean, when they turn a glass of milk over on the table because they weren't paying attention and they were reaching for something and they turned their glass over, it's, that just flies all over you at certain times. I mean, it's like, you're not paying attention. You, and especially if you have one that does it, you know, more than once. And, 
And so you have the tendency to really want to lash out at that moment. But that's just a child. That's, you know, that's being a child. That's not, that's not stubbornness, rebellion. That's not breaking the rules. That's, not, that's just a child. He just can't pay attention half the time and stuff like that. So anyway, punish corporately for stubbornness and rebellion because look at what the Bible says about stubbornness and rebellion. In uh, 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as bad as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. In other words, stubbornness and rebellion are spiritual issues within the life of your child. So what we need to do is we need to eliminate these spiritual issues. I mean, being stubborn is basically saying, I don't care what you say, I'm right, and I know it, and I'm not going to pay attention to what you say because I've got my own way, and I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to do it your way. Uh, rebellion is, I know you told me to do it this way, but I'm going to do it exactly the opposite because I don't like anybody telling me what to do. So you have to punish for those two, especially those two items, stubbornness and rebellion. And uh, the best way to punish is to uh, cause some pain. Uh, pain is the uh, great teacher of life. Now by pain, I'm not talking about torture. I'm not talking about mistreating someone. I'm not talking about hurting and harming and trying to you know, inflict uh, bodily damage. I'm talking about uh, creating a painful situation so that they say to themselves, I don't ever want to do that again. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm a pastor. I'm 61 years old. Uh, I went to school in, um, in, in, in the 60s and the 70s, and, and, um, and, and I grew up in, in home and family when all of these things were not discussed. Nobody ever knew anything about what they, my parents did and blah, blah, blah. I grew up in a generation where everyone in the community was like a parent, and they could do whatever they needed to do to discipline you. The neighbors were just as much my parent as my parent was and so forth. So I know I grew up in a different age. But I'm going to tell you something. You know why I'm standing before you today? Because my parents spanked me. Because I am the most stubborn, hard-headed, probably rebellious person that you've ever, <laughs> you've ever seen. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you what would have happened to me if my parents didn't convince me that I didn't want to be stubborn and rebellious. I would have been probably in somebody's jailhouse right now. I'd be, I wouldn't have an education. I would have quit school. I know I would have uh, because I knew more than everybody else. And, uh, and, and I would have gone my own way. There's no telling what I'd be doing, what would happen. I might even be gone by now. I don't, even, I don't know. But my parents taught me. Now, my parents weren't Christians, but they were good moral people. And they taught me right and wrong. And, they did, and when they caught me doing wrong, they convinced me that I didn't want to do that anymore um, by applying the Board of Education to the seat of higher learning. And, um, and the way they did that was uh, they, you know, and I'm going to tell you this now. Th this right here is the perfect place to spank because it has plenty of nerve endings, and it has no vital organs back here. In other words, it's really nothing to hurt back here except the nerve endings, you know? As a matter of fact, I forgot, that's probably why the Lord gave us this, because we needed a place to be able to apply some learning. And so, and so that's the place. Now look, now I mean, it's not all down the legs. It's not on their back. It's not punching them. Uh, it, it, here it is, right here. This little, this little spot right here. That little spot right there is made for, for corporal punishment, is all I'm telling you. And when you corporal punish, let me give you uh, some suggestions, all right? Here they are, and I'm going to give them to you quick. Never spank your child in public. You're, you're, you're embarrassing them. You're humiliating them. Don't, don't spank them in public because all they're worried about is what those people that are watching are, are thinking about them. You're not getting the point across. It's a bad place. Don't do it. You'll probably get, probably get arrested nowadays if you do it. So don't do it. Don't do it in public because, that, look, you just say, hey, when we get home, buddy, you're mine. Uh, whatever. Don't do it in public. Number two, always be emotionally under control. 
Do not just reach out and grab them while you're inflamed with whatever they did and just start wailing on them. Because if you do, you're going to overdo it. You're going to hurt them. And you need to just take them and sit them down in their room or whatever. It's okay if they wait four or five minutes. I mean, that's, that makes it even better. Because they're sitting in there wondering what's going to happen to them and saying, oh, no, oh, yeah. And they're thinking what they did and why they did it and why I'm never going to do that again. And, you know, I mean, it kind of gives them time to reflect a little bit about what's going on. And it gives you time to settle down. And what you need to do is settle your emotions down. Don't be all hot and hostile and reach out and just, you know, respond. And then, you know, and, and, and get you a, you know, if you're going to use a little, if you're going to use a little paddle or if you're going to use whatever you're going to use, a little, uh, I would recommend a paddle, a switch, and a belt and all those things. They make bruises and they hurt and they, they're not good. Uh, just get you a little flat, wide panel. It, it just covers lots of area back there and it doesn't, doesn't do much damage. Uh, and hit, but on your way back there, look, on the way back there, hit yourself a couple of times with it. Hit yourself so you can tell how hard you need to, to, to hit. Because, I mean, if you're mad, I'm going to tell you, you, you'll blast somebody with that thing and hurt too much is what I'm saying. So just, you know, pop yourself a couple of times so you can say, okay, that's hard enough. <laughs> that's hard enough. Okay, that's good. All right, but get yourself under control. Uh, third thing, make them tell you what they did wrong. The reason you make them tell you what they did wrong is because you're teaching them how to repent. To repent means to turn away. To, if I'm going forward, if I repent, it's about face and I start going the other way. That's repentance. Repentance is not feeling sorry for what you did. Repentance is stop doing what you're doing and head the opposite direction. So whenever I repent, I turn and I go in the opposite direction. I need to know what I need to repent of. I need to know what I'm being punished for. Am I being punished because I talked back to you, or am I being punished because uh, I stole a, a you know watermelon out of the patch down there, my neighbor? Which what am I being punished for? What do I need to repent? What is it that I don't need to do anymore that I'm being punished for right here? So make them tell you what they did, not why they did it. I told you about that. You'll make them lie if you, if you ask them why. Don't say, why did you do that? Uh, they, they did it because they wanted to. All right, what did you do? That's it. All right, so make them tell you what they did wrong. Uh, don't be swayed by their performance. Uh, give me, believe it or not, there's a Bible verse on this. Uh, Chasing your son while there's hope and let, your, and let not your soul spare for his crying. Bet you didn't know that was in the Bible, right? Yeah, in other words, they're going to they're gonna put on a show. Uh, they're going to cry before you ever even touch them. I mean, you've seen this before, right? I mean, you're going you were going to corporal punish, and then b b before you even got down there, it was like, ah! And I, I used to do that, too. I would start crying before I ever got, before the, the, the board ever got there, and, uh, and just put on a performance like you were killing me. And, man, I was crying and just... It was, like this was, I was about to die and all that. Don't look. Decide in advance. Here's about how, what I'm going to do. I'm going to give them three or four licks right here. And this is what I'm going to do. So no matter how much they scream and yell and squall and all that stuff, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this and, and then and do it. And don't be swayed by their begging. And I'll never do it again. And oh, oh you, yeah, you're so mean. Don't be for me. Get it. Get it. Uh, e, never use your hand when spanking. Hands are made for loving. Hands are made for caressing. Hands are made for touching. Seven times in the book of Proverbs, it says the rod, the rod, the rod, the rod, the rod. Get you a little, get you a little paddle. I mean, make it wide enough where it covers a little territory back there. Where it doesn't, you know, it won't bruise. It's not, you know, thin and, and, and like a stripe or a cane or something. Just get you a, a, a little wide paddle and, and uh, that'll do the job. And use that. Don't use your hand. I know every once in a while you got to use your hand, you know, at some little point. But, but, but do your best not to do that. Make your hands for loving and not for spanking. F, you must break their will, not just make them angry. Now, this is, you know, kind of one of those judgment calls for you. But I'm going to tell you, as a child, and I can remember this, when I would be spanked, I would go through several emotions. 
I would go through um, trying to uh, deny what, what that I did it. I, I would try to, uh, it was somebody else's fault. It was uh, not me. I'm, I'm being punished wrong. And then I would go through uh, accusation. And then I would go through anger. And there was a point when I was being spanked where I was so mad, I could just, ooh, I could if I'd had a gun, I'd have shot him. I mean, I'd be so mad, it would be unbelievable. But then a few more licks, I'd go past being mad. And it would, it would break that anger out of me. And it, just be, it would just be that I'm just torn up about this. And I'm, I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm punished. I'm, you know, if you, a lot of times, if you give two little old licks like that, all you did is make them mad. You got to go past making them mad. You got to break that will. And then, you know, I mean, five or six licks, man. I mean, you don't have to kill them. It's just a, a matter of not just popping them once and, 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 and then them throwing some cuss word under their breath back at you. If they still doing that, you hadn't whipped them enough. You need to get on it again. If they're looking at you like, like go to the hot spot look and cut their mouth curled up, and, ooh, 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 that you, that ain't enough. You got to get back on it. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to discipline in a, in a timeout at a football game. You're going, you're going to miss about a quarter uh, of the game. All right, so you got to go past that. Allow time for them to resolve their emotions. Let them dry up. Let them, you know, come back and get themselves pulled together uh, before they have to go out and face anybody, wipe their tears, you know, get all that. Show them how much you love them because this is what God does. Um, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes those he accepts as his children. Has God ever taken you to the woodshed? Have you, have you ever been whipped by God? Oh, yeah? Okay. Well, he did that, and then he got you back, right? He, he didn't whip you and throw you away. He spanked you, and then, and then, and then he, he loved you, and he forgave you, and he, he, he nurtured you. And you need to do this, too. You need to take time. You need to sit down and say, now, this is, this is why Daddy had to do this. I know other daddies may not do this, but listen, this is important to our families, and this is what you did. And this is why I had to do this. But, son, you know I love you. And I, I punish you because I love you. And I know that sounds weird and you won't understand this, but one day you will. One day you'll have children of your own and you'll understand what that means. And when I say it hurts me more than it hurts you, you'll be thinking, uh, don't, you know, take it easy on yourself, Dad. Uh, but it does. I mean, how many of you parents have, how many of you parents have really backed off of punishing? And don't, don't raise your hand. I'm not trying to get that. But. Uh, because you just felt so sorry for for them, and you just you you just said, "Oh, I'm, I'm gonna let this go. I'm gonna let this go," and you should have got on them, but you, you kind of let this go because you didn't want to hurt yourself. <laughs> okay, all right. Number seven, discipline with the objective of establishing inner restraints. I, I, I know I'm at at 11:44. I'll be just a minute. Okay, I'm gonna hurry through. Discipline with the objective of establishing inner restraints. Listen. What you're trying to do when you discipline is you're, is you're trying to uh, teach them where the boundaries are. That's what you're trying to do. You're saying, all right, right here's a boundary. Don't pass over this boundary. You're trying to teach them what's right and what's wrong and what they can do and what they can't do. And, and, and rules are given to people who can't control themselves, right? I mean, see, I don't have any rules now. We don't, there, Tanya doesn't have any rules for me, and I don't have any rules for her. Why? Because we can control ourselves. We don't need rules because we control our actions and our behaviors and our desires and our thoughts and all that. So you only have rules when you can't control yourself. So what you're trying to teach them by discipline is how to control themselves and where the lines are. Okay, all right, so discipline with the objective of, I mean, don't discipline thinking you're going to, you just want to punish somebody. That's not what it's about. It's about teaching them how to live a great life and know what's right and know what's wrong and how to control themselves and do what's right. Number eight, teach children to deny themselves. In other words, make them wait. <clears throat> make them wait. Uh, don't give them everything uh, immediately. The, you, you, you're, what you're combating is I want what I want when I want it. Um, 
let me have what I want right now. And I'm telling you, these kids these days, buddy, they want it right now. I mean, like immediate, instant gratification. Boom, 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 boom. Make them wait. Make them wait. It, 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 they need to learn how to wait. They need to know that everything can't be given right there at that moment. And when you make them wait, it just teaches them how to deny themselves. How to say, okay, I need to be patient some. I can't have everything I want. Because one of these days, they're going to walk out to the mailbox, and there's going to be this little mail in the, in the mailbox that says, hey, this is my name, and it says I can have a card that says I can get anything I want anytime I want it. Hot dog, that's what I've been waiting on. And then, boom, they're going to ruin themselves financially because you didn't teach them how to deny themselves. You didn't teach them that they can't have everything they want right when they want it. Sometimes they have to save for some stuff. Make them save for some stuff. Don't let them, you know, give $5 for cutting the grass, whatever it might be, and then the first thing you do, man, you got to take them down to the store right then because they got to spend that money right there. Say, no, you're not spending that. Go put it in that bank in there. We'll talk about this later, you know, and then wait about two or three weeks and then say, okay, uh, what was it we were going to talk about, you know? <laughs> I mean, make them wait. It, it, it's not going to kill them. It hurts them. Number nine, progress from master guide to friend. This just means that in life you have to, there's a progress. Uh, uh, kids, little bitty children, little tiny children need a master. They need somebody to tell them everything to do. Everything they can, everything they can't, take care of them, all that. All right, when they get to be teenagers, they don't need a master anymore. Somebody telling them what they need to do with everything. They need, they need, they need a, a, a guide. And a guide just is somebody who says, okay, here's the line, you can't go past this line, you can't do this, that's too much, no, can't have... I mean, you just, you just keep them in the boundaries, and you let them make some decisions. And maybe that sometimes they make goofy decisions or wrong decisions, but especially if it's not going to really hurt them, you know, and it's going to be something they can make a decision and learn a lesson, hey, don't do that again. If it's not too critical, you can let them make those kind of decisions, and then they can learn, and, and you're just guiding them. And then as they become adults you become their friend. And when you have adult children, you're their friend. You, you, hopefully you're a trusted friend. Hopefully you're somebody they'll come to and talk to about things and say, hey, Dad, what you think about this? Or, or what would that be? Or, Mom, or, you know, can you think this would be a good thing to do? Or, or, or what would you say about this? And that kind of thing. And you earn that because you have been a master, you've been a guide. But in other words, your, your life changes. You, you, when your children get to be adults, you're not going to control their lives. They're going to do what they want to do. And you just got to hope that you've established a relationship so they'll at least talk to you about some of the things they're going to do. So in case there's something you might want to input that would be helpful, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Okay? All right, here. Now here, what is this, number 10? Okay, number 10. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> Walk in forgiveness. Walk in forgiveness. Look, they did it. You punished them for it. Get over it. Don't hold it against them for the rest of their life. I mean, look, they did it. You told them it was wrong. You punished them because it was wrong. Uh, let it go. Let it go. The end. Right. The end. Let them back in. Look, God lets us back in. God forgives us. And in a family, there has to be forgiveness. Don't hold it over their head the rest of their life and punish them for the rest of their life. You've got to let it go. All right. Stand to your feet, would you?